Hello and welcome to this exploring session, this first look, first session looking at the rare triumphs of love and fortune played before the Queen's most excellent majesty, wherein are many fine conceits with great delight. So it's uh, a play printed in 1589, uh, but uh, we are fairly certain that it was prefer performed not only in 1582, but it was performed on the 30th of December. Um, uh, I think it was a Sunday. Uh, anyway, uh, so we, we, we've got a fairly uh, a good idea when it at least once was performed uh, before the Queen and may have been performed other times as well. It's by the uh, first iteration and it always gets a bit confusing with some companies uh, of the Derby's men um, and yeah that's 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 a whole kettle of fish I don't want to get into at this particular moment in time uh, we're going to be diving into the first few acts we're going to get into act three uh, it gets a bit fiddly when we stop today as to how far we're going to get we may plow on to the end of act three because in, in a rush of enthusiasm and completely destroy the schedule for the rest of the week it's entirely possible it depends how excited everybody gets with this text so we have this wonderful array of readers today so a uh, reading hermione today is Muted at present. Hello, I'm Helen Good. I'm a historian and I'm in Hull. Uh, reading Jupiter and Penulu today is... Aliki Chapel, actor and theatrical translator based in Lancaster, England. Uh, reading Fortune today is... Elizabeth Misu and I'm also based in Romford. Uh, reading Armenia today is... Hi, I'm Alan Scott, not based in Armenia, but based in Suffolk. Uh, reading Tosiphone and Bomelio is... I am Lois, a retired academic living in London. Uh, reading Mercury and Fidelia today is... Hi, I'm Eric, and I can speak really bad Armenian. Uh, reading Fizantes and Vulcan today is... Hi, uh, Steve Longstaff, scholar of early modern drama based in the northwest of England. And joining us for the first time, be gentle everyone, reading Venus and Lentulo today is... Bryony e. Sparrow, um, I'm based in the East Midlands in the UK and I'm an actress and drama enthusiast. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I'll be reading stage directions and leaping in if I have completely cocked up who's reading what, which today we've had a, a few switcheroos going on uh, is entirely possible. Uh, but without further ado, we are going to leap into the first act. Um, I don't think the text that we're looking at has any uh, meaningful scene divisions. So we may be adding scene divisions as we go. Uh, so, but this is uh, where we open the play and there are a lot of gods dancing around here. Enter Mercury, then riseth a fury, then enter the assembly of the gods, Jupiter with Juno, Apollo with Minerva, Mars and Saturn after Vulcan with Venus. The fury sets debate amongst them and after Jupiter speaks as followeth. Ye gods and goddesses, whence springs this strife of late? Who are the authors of this mutiny? Or whence hath sprung this civil discord here, which on the sudden struck us in this fear? If gods that reign in skies do fall at war, no marvel then though mortal men do jar. But now I see the cause. Thou fury fell, bred in the dungeon of the deepest hell. Who causeth thee to show thyself in light? And what thy message is, I charge thee, tell, upright. O oh, Jupiter, thou dreadful king of gods and men, the father high, to whose command the heavens, the earth, and lowest hell obey. To Siphone, the daughter of eternal night, bred in the bottom of the deepest pit of hell, brought up in blood and cherished with scrawling snakes, tormenting therewith all the damned souls of them here upon earth that careless live of thy commandment. I am the same. I am the same whom both my loathsome sisters hate, whom hell itself complains to keep within her race, whom every fearful soul detesteth with a curse, 
whom earth and seas defy, heaven's loathing to behold. <laughs> I am the same. I am the same, sent from thy brother Pluto now. Thy brother Pluto, king of hell and golden mines, sent unto thee, and these thy fellow gods I am. From him to thee, from him by me, to tell thee to thy face, he hath been lately rubbed and touched perhaps too near, which he na can na will put up without revenge, if thou or any god the quarrel dare defend. And this it is, thy daughter Venus, thy proud daughter Venus here, blabs it abroad and beareth all the world in hand, she must be thought the only goddess in the world, exalting and suppressing whom she likes best, defacing altogether fortune's grace, breaking her altars down, dishonoring her name, whose government thyself, thyself dost know. How sayest thou, dost thou not? Her father, therefore, thy brother Pluto, sends by me the messenger of discord and debate, commanding or desiring, choose thou whether of both, her honor still entire she may maintain, else on thy daughter Venus, that lascivious dame, himself will wreak his high despite on her. Depart, foul fiend, unto thy loathsome cell, where thou lamenting makes continual moan. Go tell my brother, were it not for him, thou shouldst have rued thy bold presumption. Say thou thy message hath been largely heard, and Bid him send his daughter fortune. Now, whilst we are here, the matter may have end. Dispatch. I go. Give place, thou air. Open, thou earth. Gay hollow hell below. And unto all that live and breathe, I wish a world of woe. I'm going to pause mid-scene as exit to Siphony, um, who's, you know, clearly uh, such a cheerful personage. Um, for so many interesting uh, sort of, I was sort of noting just that nature, the way the dumb show works at the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm noting all sorts of interesting parallels with other plays. I mean, that opening's reminding me a bit of Cobbler's Prophecy that we did a, a, f a few weeks back. I wasn't expecting to see that suddenly in this, um, but um, yes, we've got lots of gods. We've got people uh, having a bit of a, a, a Barney. Um, and uh, yeah, we get this, this dumb show setting up. I'm really interested by these. I, I don't know if this is just an error in the text i don't think it is it looks deliberate um but the it's like there's a crowd shouting at you and that you have to stop and say things again to be heard mm -hmm. and that this is a much more dynamic uh motion than it's not just someone giving a speech it's someone trying to be heard uh mm -hmm. and that there are objections to it because we have in the stage direction the fury sets debate amongst them so that there there is a sense that you know these characters many of whom we've had all these various gods mentioned at the beginning who do not speak or who will not speak and we haven't finished the scene by any stretch of the imagination mm. so this is a really energized opening I, i'm really i'm really liking that um who wants to leap in as to what the hell's going on as well as other thoughts Stephen, then eric yeah i was i was wondering about that too this this because i was thinking oh well, this is a dumb show isn't it but setting debate is it's almost like i don't know a freeze frame and somebody clicks their fingers or something like that you know that the, they are in a uh, on a different plane to the fury at this point and i think it could you know if we were doing a production of it i think this could be a, a really really great way to to open it you know hmm. yeah uh, eric i was gonna say that yeah it's probably like i am the same and then i am the same sent from their brother pluto and all that stuff it just feels like as you said, like she's about to be interrupted, sort of. I am the same, glares at the crowd. I am the same, the for whom thy loathsome sisters hate, and so on and so forth. 
Well, it, it kind of you kind of wonder why there's so much repetition that thy daughter of Venus, thy proud daughter of Venus, and all that stuff. It's like we we I mean, surely even the audience knows who Venus is by this point, even if she's not actually the daughter of Jupiter, mythologically speaking. <laughs> they're, they're, they're all interrelated somehow. Um, a leaky. I wonder if the crowd noise is still going on. There is, as you say, very much that sense with, with Ju Jupiter's opening speech, almost like a teacher wading into a schoolyard fight and pulling them all apart. What's all this then? So they could still be bubbling up and shouting mm. to require, I say, I, thy daughter, thy daughter. <laughs> Well, it's it's not it's 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 worse, isn't it? Because it's it starts off thy daughter Venus, thy proud daughter <laughs> Venus here blabs it. I mean, it's really insulting, really laying it into Venus uh, there. Um, so yeah, it's a very dynamic um, uh, bit bit of action, uh, and then presumably a trap door, uh, and uh, uh, you know, flame shoots up, Ella, the Wicked Witch of the West, and down you pop. Um, you know, there's there's so many options there uh, for health and safety to go mad. Stephen, um, yeah, well, just sort of picking up on what people are saying, it's it's really interesting from the queuing point of view, isn't it? Because when people think about queuing. They tend to think about how one line cues another. And what we've got here is a great slab of text, which you, you could argue has got some sense of, of uh, embedded cues. Um, but how those, how, how the people who are uh, going to be heckling or whatever it is, where they get their cues from is a really interesting thing, I think. Um, and it's, it's something that people really really don't talk about very much you know what happens during the big speeches in terms of queuing yeah it, it we've got a repeated queue so the uh, so the crowd knows at least two of them um if uh, are, are going to be the same queue so they can just make a noise whenever i am the same happens um okay there are a couple more potentially in there but you know if we get the two big ones in um uh, the rest of the actors on stage will remember to do those <laughs> Other thoughts before, you know, I, I stopped very early, so uh, uh, you don't have to leap in straight away. Um, okay, we will move on. So, Tosifni has fallen into the pits <clears throat> of, uh, of, of wherever. Uh, and the scene continues, Jupiter, Mercury, Vulcan, Venus, et al. The powers divine, be reconciled again. Depart from discord and extreme debate. Within your breasts, let love and peace remain, a perfect pattern of your heavenly state, while I'm a go to hell condemning hate. Thus, when the high powers is in one, men upon earth will fly contention. Great God and Father mine, your care and fear of us and eke of the, all the world beside, that restless tolls in his continual sphere, whereby all things in perfect course abide, as one arrays another forth to side slide and this example may prevail for all to work our wills according to your call and i dare say presuming on the rest the poison of this rancor is suppressed oh ye agree my masters i cannot tell well we are bad we too could agree well gramercy mercury i know thy will is ever pressed to further my desire in sign whereof to quiet all things well and to suppress betimes the secret fire that I perceive would break and mount up, up higher. This to prevent, content ye here to stay. Do mark a while what for themselves they say. And Venus, here I charge thee on my grace, not that I found thee heretofore untrue, but for thine adversary is not yet in place, thou tell uprightly whence your quarrel grew what words betwixt you thereof did ensue say lovely daughter tell us flat thy mind they shall be blamed on whom the fault we find O oh, thou that governest everything that gods and men attempt and with thy fearful thunderbolt their doings dost prevent what hath thy daughter so deserved? What doth she, silly dame, before ye thus to be abused with undeserved blame? Surely that, but that my duty commands me now to speak, for such trifling cause this way my wrath I would not wreak. 
but she no marvel though she seek my seat thus to stain when other ways she cannot tell advantage how to gain but thence this hot despite hinc ille lacrime excuse pronunciation because i say she could not prove herself of power with me for all you godheads know she pains but such as pleasure knew she never grieves the groaning mind where gladness never grew she never overthrows but at the top of joy for they that never tasted bliss mislike not their annoy but i torment the mind that ever that never felt relief i plague the wretch that never thought on comfort in his grief that never had the hope of any happy chance that never once so much as deemed i would his state advance Think then, which of us both are of the greater power, once in his life, or not at all, to grant a lightning hour? I need not stand to make rehearsal here at all, for gods and ghosts, yea, men and beasts, unto my power are thrall. I dare appeal to you, if I should look awry, say, Father, with your leave, in heaven, who dares my word deny? And if I please to smile, who will not laugh outright, whereby my great omnipotence is known to every white. I make the noble love the bastard in degree. I tame and temper all the tongues that rail and scoff at me. What bird, what beast, what worm, but feeleth my delight? What lives or draweth breath, but I can pleasure or despite? Yet diverse things there be that fortune cannot tame, as are the riches of the mind, or else an honest name. Or a contented heart, still free from fortune's power, but such as climb before they crawl, must drink the sweet with sour. Thyself, O Jupiter, didst grant sometimes to me, of all things here beneath the moon I should the ruler be. Thou sayst I did deserve the honour of that praise, thyself didst once devise whereby my glory first to raise. Is this my sovereignty? Is this so glorious? Is this becoming thy renown to quit thy daughter thus? Fair not fair Venus, neither be dismayed. Repose thee on the warrant of my word. What I have promised, doubt not to be performed. The spareless destinies my will afford. Let this defend thee like a trusty sword. The Lady Fortune cometh now, I see. Welcome, fair dame. What is thy will with me? And enter Fortune. Favorite powers divine, how should I now begin? In which way should I couch my words, your favors for to win? I may pull out my plaint. But thou mayst it redress. My father humbly prays me to give me leave to speak, and pardon him that in his wrath he did your quietness break. I cannot but confess, dread gods, I am not she that seeks with Venus to compare in her supremacy. I am not of that power, yet am I of some might, which she usurping challengeth to keep me from my right. I grant she may do much with her alluring smiles, but soon your godheads can perceive her words be full of wiles. What be the tragedies, the terrors that she makes? Let's see the mighty monarchs, the kingdoms that she shakes. Poor soul, she suddenly lives with wanton super joys, triumphing in her own delight upon her foolish toys. Sometimes she flattereth it in pleasure mixed with pain, like to a fair sunshine day overcast with clouds of rain. But should I reckon up what things I can confound? What is it then, or what hath been, or shall for I be found? Is not the wonder of the world a work that soon decays? Therefore, ye see, all earthly things are wearing out always, as bitter as the glass, unconstant like the mind as fickle as the whirling wheel, as wavering as the wind. No, such I am that overthrows the highest red tower, that changes and supplanted realms in twinkling of an hour, and send them hasty smart whom I devise to spoil, not threatening or forewarning them, but at a smile, where joy doth most abound, 
There I do sorrow place, and them I chiefly persecute that pleasure did embrace. What greater grief can fall to man in all his life than after sweet to taste the sour, in peace to be at strife? It is a biting thought that fretted, that fretted on the heart to say the time was when I enjoyed, though now oppressed with smart. If every mighty king did escape untouched of me, if every year or month or day or if an hour might be, wherein I have not used to practice some exchange, perhaps for this authority I might be thought to range, too far beyond my right, but even the very stars, the heavens, the planets and the seas, bear witness of my scars. No more of that, good dame, you run too far at Rome, I'll take the pains to keep you short and call you nearer home. I pray you, what's your might when all are well beloved? The sweetest lovers in distress, the sharpest storms have proved. Perhaps for want of wealth, but if their riches slack? They are the very instrument whereby I work their woe. What, if their friends abound, then they can, then, then, then can they never lack? Friends are scattered when fortune turns her toe. If they be noble born or of a princely blood. When fortune sounds that may procure more harm than do them good. But wise men evermore upon a rock are set. Yet can they not escape a scourge, for fortune hath a net. I will not in till things be well discerned. Affection shall not mar a lawful cause. By examples, this may best be learned. In elder ages, led within your laws. Therefore, a while hereof, I mean to pause and bring in Mercury in open view the ghosts of them that love and fortune slew. I word my will, thou triple headed Cerberus, give place, and I command thee, Charon, with thy ferry boat, transport the souls of such as may report fortune and love and not in open sort. Let them appear to us in silent show to manifest the truth that we must know. And before we finish the scene, uh, we're about to have a, a silent show. Um, I'm going to find out how well that's going to go for everyone. But I think we should really just uh, get into the difference between Venus's uh, speech. There's, there's quite a a difference between Venus's speech and Fortune's speech. Um, uh, I think there was a bit in the chat about how Venus, uh, we, we hit fourteeners. We always like to hit, have a fourteener um, coming into uh, into play. But then Fortune's is a lot more irregular in the verse. Um, and then we have this nice back and forth moment at the end. Um, thoughts about the nature of uh, the the difference between Ven uh, Venus and Fortune here, love and fortune. Uh, just to call back to the title of the play there. Um, just a hint might be important. Uh, any any thoughts from the room about this 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 sort of uh, standing standing match, as it were? Anyone want to leap in, Lois? Yeah, what puzzled me is why we needed to symphony at all. I mean, the thing could perfectly well have begun with the, you know each of the goddesses complaining to to Jupiter. It's as if they just wanted to have a big show at the beginning. Don't knock it. Don't knock it. It's always a, it's always a good way. It's just smoke, smoke, flash bots, um, terrifying, terrifying demons figures. It's always good fun. Eric. Well, I'm get, I'm just wondering whether like Tiffany is basically the prologue, sort of setting the scene and stuff, and sort of going, yeah, the, this one is uh, the daughter of the of Pluto, and this one is the daughter of Jupiter, and so on and so forth. It kind of. Um, you know, she tells you who's who, basically. Yeah. Yeah. In the red corner, we have Venus. And in the blue corner, we have Fortune, who isn't in the room. So we know who Venus is because we can point at them over there. Um, and Fortune will enter in a bit. Um, yeah. Set, telling us what we're about to see. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I like that very much. Uh, other thoughts? Um, Aliki. We've had uh, Venus and Mars at, at odds before, but I don't think we've seen Venus and Fortune. And that's quite nice to have two goddesses each going, I am the most powerful. <laughs> Enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be a thing, isn't it? We, we've, we've, we've definitely tri tripped over quite a few plays now of late uh, that are dancing around 
uh, various various uh, power matches between various gods. Uh, you know, going all the way back to uh, sort of a slightly different arrangement of things with arraignment of Paris, which is not dissimilar in terms of timing, um, and and other plays where we've we've been touching slightly Lily, later Lily plays, which have been t- playing around with some god god action as well. Uh, Eric. Uh, but haven't we also had like Venus versus Juno, which always seems to be the combination that is like, um, you know, the two master goddesses of the world or mis- I don't know, mistress goddesses? That just sounds weird. But like, you know, um, yeah. Uh, yes, that's Dido, isn't it? Um, am, I, am I wrong? On Among that? other things. I think there were two plays where we had that, mm. perhaps. Yeah, how do how do we keep them all straight in our heads when we have done so many? Uh, other thoughts? Um, I say, just what's going on with characters? You know, that 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 fortune is written in this slightly less regular beat. I'm wondering whether Venus has had time to prepare her speech, and therefore it's a very <laughs> well structured bit of verse. Whereas fortunes just come in, bit of a sweat, bit of a hurry. Hang on, right? You're saying what now? Um, I, is there a character note about that, or am I just projecting? Um, uh, Brownie? Um, I, well, I, I'll agree with it from the point of view of having just read Venus because it was just, it was really nice and easy. And, and I like that idea that she's had time to sit and, and get a little speech written. It, yeah, that fits with how it felt to read it. Hmm. Um, yeah, how was fortune for you, Elizabeth? Yes. Um, so, um, well, do you see Helen and Alan? They will have their hands up. Um, Fortune was lovely, but what I really liked about Fortune was the way the other characters were talking about her before she actually came on scene. So I was kind of like in this anticipatory kind of mood, waiting for her to arrive, and then she does come and then she gives her whole speech. So I thought that was really, really cool. Yeah, if only Fortune would enter as as she does in uh, liberality and prodigality with feather boas and everything uh, on a chariot. Uh, I'm, I think we should demand that as a rider for Fortune. Uh, Alan, <laughs> then Helen. I, I was just thinking, I mean, very well done, Brani, on reading that Venus speech. I mean, absolutely so-and-so to, to try and memorise, I would have thought. I, I think the thing about fourteen is, is once you've clicked into them, the, 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 it, it's it's a lot easier than it looks. But it's it's when you jump from one verse form to another that, that it does do terrible things to your brain. Uh, Helen. Yeah, I mean, jumping from one verse form to another is so unusual in this. You know, Jupiter is pentameters always, and Venus is. Uh, Fourteeners always, as far as I can tell, and fortune is 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 all over the shop. Um, <laughs> Our friends, mm. yeah. But what I what I liked about fortune was how implacable fortune is. The sweetest lovers get the sharpest storms, and um. Then you the, the, the big one is if they are noble born or of a princely blood. And fortune says, yeah, well, that'll do them more harm than good when I get my, get going. Um, and I think it's I think it's I think it's a, a, I like fortune here. Mm. Well, we have a little more evidence to gather about this particular. I mean, we can't call it a court proceedings because nobody's on trial per se. But, there's, you know, there is a certain amount of what the hell is going. I did like earlier, actually, just uh, when we restarted the scene of just Jupiter after Tisiphone disappears, just going, OK, calm down, everyone. Can we just just take a moment? Um, I, I, that a good example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it's it's again. It's also going even further back. It's reminding me of Player of the Weather as well. The way Jupiter, uh, uh, he doesn't have to referee the room though in the same way. It's inferred that he tried, uh, but you don't actually see it happen. So we've got the calling now of silent witnesses um, to uh, who's better, love or fortune. Um, so um, the uh, uh, Charon with thy ferry boat is going transporting. Um, people on stage and uh, stage direction Mercury strikes with his rod three times Vulcan isn't so keen on this idea Are you mad my masters? What a stir have we here? Lord have mercy on us Must the devil appear? Come away wife When I pray thee come away 
Yeah, down on your knees, my masters, and pray. Music plays. Enter the show, the dumb show of Troilus and Cressida, who do some stuff. Behold how Troilus and Cressida cries out on love that framed their decay. That was like the old wife when her ale would not come. Thrust a fire round in the ground and scratched her bum. Okay. Uh, music <laughs> continues playing. Enter the dumb show of Alexander. <laughs> Alexander the Great, that all the world subdued, curseth fell fortune that did him delude. Tis an honest grim sire at his first coming out, believe me. Had he stood in the wind, he might have smelt me. Music plays Enter the Show of Queen Dido. Queen Dido, that Aeneas could not move, stabbed herself and yielded unto love. More fool she, and she were my own brother. My wife would not love me. Must I not love another? Music plays. Enter the dumb show of Pompey and Caesar. Pompey and Caesar, the wonders of their time, by froward fortune spoiled in their prime. Well, it was served well enough. Why could they not be content with a roach and a red herring in the holy time of Lent? Music plays. Enter the show of Leander and Hero. Hero and Leander presents them very loath that felt the love of the, the force of love and fortune both. Upon him I my sovereignty did show. I think you, dame, my power she did not know. But it was I that dashed their delight. After that after that I had proved my open might. Oh, what a scolding is it? Shall it even thus be that you? Look like an honest man in the parish, pray you make them agree. And then you both, I'll hear no more of this. And Mercury, Circes, call out no more. I have bethought me how to work their wish, as you have often proved it heretofore. Here in this land, within that princely bower, there is a prince beloved of his love, on whom I mean your sovereignties to prove. Venus. For that they love thy sweet delight, thou shalt endeavour to increase their joy, and fortune, thou, to manifest thy might, their pleasures and their pastimes, shall destroy, for thwarting them with news of fresh annoy. And she that most can please them, or despite, I will confirm to be of greatest might. Your godhead hath devised as I desire, and I am gladly therewithal content. And I am pressed to do as you require. Now shall you see the proof of my intent. Take up your places here to work your will. When you have done, the rest I shall fulfill. Steps sunning like a crow in a gutter. What, are they gone? Uh, uh, you be quiet, sirs. They will make you good sport with their scolding. And on. Oh, not these a sort of good manly gods to get them thus away. I must take pains to overtake them. I see they will not stay. And exit. Why, well, it says exit, omnes. Uh, I suspect everyone exited during Vulcan uh, speech there, and Vulcan now exits. That's the end of the first act. Uh, this this scene is this whole act is is just dancing from one genre to another. Uh, it's fascinating. So we start with this sort of semi horrific opening potentially. Uh, then we get into a sort of little mini debate debating circle. Uh, then we get these dumb shows with Vulcan doing his stand up routine. Um, and it is it's it's literally it's it's he's just there uh, doing the Waldorf and Statler bit at the end. Uh, but then it's also it could be like a football match because it's love one. Fortune, one. Uh, love, two. Fortune, two. And then it's a no-score draw in the final result there. So we're going down to points. And then Jupiter just does what Jupiter does, which says, OK, let's mess around with some mortals' lives just to prove a point. Um, and that's what we're here for. So that's setting up uh, the introduction of human people. Um, yeah, thoughts from the room about all of this. I mean, it's, it's really fun, I have to say, so far. I mean, it's, it's, it's doing all sorts of work. I'm, uh, I'm hoping there'll be more gods as we go, but uh, maybe we're going to be uh, dancing around with mostly humans for the rest. Uh, let's see what happens. But yeah, thoughts from the room. Uh, Eric, then Helen. 
Uh, at the beginning, when Tiffany started speaking out, I thought, yeah, this is totally going to be like Gizmunda <laughs> or, you know, like other fil- uh, not films, uh, plays where we've had, you know, Furies coming out, up out of the floor. And then, of course, um, <laughs> it took an interesting turn. <laughs> it just went sort of, yeah, now, now we're going to pit these two goddesses against each other and see what happens. But what, what I found interesting was that they're not competing to sort of go... Yeah, I, love is better than fortune in a good way. They're kind of competing to sort of go who can wreak the most havoc in someone's life, which is <laughs> not ideal. No, absolutely. Yes, uh, that, that's one of those things that people, you know, ah, I have the power to ruin lives. Nobody, nobody's really that interested in the power to make everyone happy. Uh, Helen? Yeah, um, I, I must say I was startled by Vulcan. I, I mean, the, the, the character is totally familiar to us. We've met him over and over and over again. Um, he's referring to the parish. He's talking, he's talking about things that are utterly familiar, but never as a named god, even yeah. Vulcan, yeah, I he... don't think. Or have I missed that play? I, I don't think so. I mean, he's 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 had a slightly rough around the edges quality to him before, uh, or actually rather later in other plays. But um, as pure stand-up, you know, being the vice slash clown figure, you know, if it was an earlier cl- uh, play, this, you know, doing what the vice does in earlier plays of basically talking to the audience explicitly and saying, you know, there's a good bit coming up next. Um, and, and doing all that business. It's really interesting. Alan, then Stephen. I must admit, going back to Eric's one, you know, of, you know, why not set up something to make the mortals uh, miserable? I thought that was the raison d'etre of most of the Greek pantheon. Oh, yes. Well, well God, God, God's do it. But I don't know if... I, it does seem to be a thing that drama of this time is doing as a reason for plots to do certain things. Um... And obviously, there are there are films that do similar things. Uh, Stephen, then Aliki. Uh, I'm just wondering about about the pacing of the Vulcan bit because it does seem to be kind of as people are saying in the chat, you know, sort of sparky and interactive. But uh, Vulcan gets you know a, a coupler, but in between that, we've got music and a show. And I'm just I'm I don't know what they mean by show. It may not be a dumb show. I suppose it could mm-hmm. be something else but it it seems uh, it's like sort of you know 17 year old having a driving lesson or something it's all going smoothly and we've got a bit of comic repartee and then <laughs> right you know it's the car starts sort of hopping along like a kangaroo when we have music in the show of queen dido or vice versa whichever way around you want to play it so this sort of mix i'm just wondering how it would how it would work you know that the, the, the Vulcan takes the wind out of the sails of these shows, but the shows take the wind out of the sails of Vulcan as well, don't they? Because he's just got to shut up while however long this thing is happens. Well, I think he's riffing less on the show, but more on undermining Mercury. I mean, in terms of, you know, the show happens, um, but the timing of how the show functions and how that runs... Um, it, it seems like Vulcan is deliberately undermining Mercury rather than necessarily the show. But I could be wrong on that point. Um, right. Uh, but that's how. It, but that's partly because we can only see the words; we can't see the show. So I could be entirely wrong on that point. Uh, Aliki Lois. I'm just going to push back slightly on the idea that everybody wants to make mortals' lives miserable. Venus has been assigned the job of making these two lovers happy. It's, but they're so, interfering, so it's going to go horribly. Yeah, well. okay, but what it reminds me of is the story, and I don't know what the origin of this story is, but the story of the contention between the sun and the north wind for whether they can get a man, whether they can take a man's coat away from him, where the north wind blows harder and harder trying to get the, blow the coat away. I thought this was a folktale, but you're all looking very blank. No, no, no. Well, not only is it a folktale, it was in an epilogue of one of the Lily plays we did recently. Right. Okay. So that. Mm. Uh, Okay. So if it's in an epilogue of one of the Lily plays before this, after this? No, after. 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 Only by about, you know. It's around in the culture. 
I mm. guess. I don't know what the origin is, but it reminds me of that. It's the, you try and make them happy, you try and make them sad, and we'll see who wins. Mm. Uh, Lois? Yeah, I think it's an Aesop fable, isn't it? But the right. you know, it just strikes me, this is an extremely long play, or at least this is an extremely long act if they do a proper dumb show for uh, each of these appearances. Uh, you know, there's a well-known reference to crowds not liking anything except dumb shows. And I, uh, this certainly looks as if they're appealing to the crowd in that way. And that's sort of, uh, you know, the combination of the, the sort of clown figure and plenty of visual spectacle. That's presumably the point at the beginning as well. Uh, I don't know, it just, uh, uh, I mean, maybe it is just a show, you know, they come on in a chariot and pass across the stage and go out. It also seems to be a cast of thousands. I mean, even for, um, was this a Queen's Men play? I mean, it, even for them, it seems to be an awful lot of people. Uh, well, it's it's we know it's performed before the Queen. Uh, it's Derby's uh, men. Uh, yeah. However, they're situated at that particular point. They're an irritating company to get a handle on because yeah. uh, it changes over time. Uh, I mean, it depends how ex extensive it is. It could literally be Troy and Cressida come on and go no to love. And then the other one comes on and goes no to fortune. And it's actually very simple. Or it could go on for ages. And, you yeah. know, that's. For us, that's dealer's choice. Um, uh, other thoughts uh, before we move on, because we probably should in a moment. Eric? Well, kind of what you said about the football match got me thinking that it's like when you've got two commentators, Mercury and Vulcan, and one of them is like, and now we have the, you know, uh, passing to Rooney and so on and so forth. And then you've got the other guy who doesn't really, who's sort of like bouncing off ideas off the other person sort of in a comical way. <laughs> got the mercury the new young thrusting reporter and vulcan the really really tired who wants to retire uh, possibly dr uh, drinks too much reporter yes um <laughs> uh, anyway we need to move on i'm going to probably let the second act run uh without stopping and starting too much uh, i think it's all pretty one much one movement of action but i could be wrong on that point let's let's give it its head as it uh, a head of steam and see what happens so we have enter hermione and fidelia why then my dear what is the greatest prize in love absence of other griefs the greatest that loving hearts can prove but absence cannot minish love or make it less in aught yet nevertheless it leaves a doubt within the other's thought and what is that Lest change of air should change the absent mind. That fault is proper, but to them whom jealousy makes blind. Oh, pardon it for that the thought for that the cause from whence it springs is such. From whence is that? My mother says from loving overmuch. Your author I will not admit that rests us it to prove. Be sure it is that jealousy proceeds of fervent love. Can that be fervent love, wherein suspicion leads the mind? Most fervent love, where so much love doth make the fancy blind. But faithful love can never be, wherein suspect doth dwell. The faithful lovers do suspect, because they love so well. My dear Fidelia, as I think thy love is such to me, so fervent, faithful, and unstained, as pure a nun can be, Admit occasions fall out then, that I must part from thee. Tell me, wilt thou mean space, suspect inconstancy in me? If so, I do impute it to the force of lovers' laws that oftentimes are touched with fear, where, whereas there is no cause. What have I heard? What do mine eyes behold? Dishonour to the house from whence I came. Unshamefast girl, forgetful, all too bold. And thou, false traitor, author of the same, sufferest not the guerdon of thy due. The king, my father's gracious countenance, must thou climb, ungrateful and untrue. These steps at first thine honour to advance. Hath fortune promised so much hope at first to make thy conquest of a prince's child? Should I stand to question how thou durst to leave to think she might be so beguiled? But words may not suffice to wreak this wrong hid under cloak of over hardy love. Thou upstart fondling, 
and forborne too long to give such cause thy prince's ire to Nay, move. my good brother, take it not so what? The, the, the fault is mine, and I will bear, bear the blame. And to return you an answer, well, I wot how to defend the honour of my name. But for my love, I am resolved in this. However you count of his defaults, with vowed affection holy to be his, as one in whom I spy more, more uh, special parts than fall in fondlings of the baser kind, to have a word not squaring with the place, but measure men by their unstained minds. Let fortune be to virtue no disgrace, for fortune when and where it likes her majesty with clouds and can cover birth in highest degree. What, dame, and are you so shameless in your shame? No, mistress, no, it will not let be let past, but willful wench. This new attempted game, ere it be won, will ask another cast. And lady, cloak his virtues as you will. He'll be, but as I said, a fondling still. As had I thought, my lord, a man so wise as you, son to a prince, scholar to him, that depth of learning knew. Among many lessons won, this rule could wisely find to have the government of wrath and rancour in your mind. What high offence is given unto your father's grace? I take it nothing needful here, by to reason of the case. But stand he less contented, or pleased here with all? My lord, that thus you should mislike the cause is very small. The unremoved love I bear my lady here, whose countenance my comfort is that holds my love as dear, commands me to digest such hard and bitter words as not with credit to your of your state your honour here affords. Else, Prince, persuade thyself. My mind were not so base to pocket, but for such respects, so hard and foul disgrace. And this lady, Hermione, for aught that men do know, by birth may be as nobly brought, born as Prince Armenio. Traitor, thou shalt not joy that proud comparison. My good Hermione, come hence, let him alone. <coughs> Nay, dame, it likes me not that you should go. Whether thou wilt, Armenio, she shall, though thou say no. What, shall she, villain? Help, help, alas! And yes, here, enter Physantes, the prince, a lord, and Penulo, a parasite. What stir is here? What means this broil begun? Give me to know the occasion of this strife. How falls it out? Armenia. My son, a wound received by stroke of naked knife. Say to me straight which one hath done this deed. His blows are big that makes a prince to bleed. My sovereign father, pardon his offence, whose grief of mind is greater than his wound. My, my rightful quarrel yields me safe defence, and here they stand, the guilty must be found. Traitor, O king, unto your majesty, whose proud attempt to touch your grace so near, as what may be the greatest villainy upon recital shall be opened here. My sister and your far unworthy child, forgetting love and fear of gods and thee, and honour of a name is thus beguiled, to love this gentleman whom here you see, Hermione, who for a jewel of some price, old hermit gave your highness long ago, and I forgave and for gave, I gave rebuked her device. In gallant thought, she would not take it so. But as it seems to do my body good, I thank him, deigned himself to let me blood. Hermione, and hast thou done this deed? Couldst thou shrine such treason in my thought? Armenia, jest not with thy hurt, take heed, and thou... <coughs> Fond girl, whose stained blood hath wrought, how mine age and honour been abused! My princely care, Hermione, of thee, 
I, the fault so great it cannot be excused, and you enforce the shame thereof to see. But far we fear some father ill may fall through love and hate of one and of the other, uh, foolish love, I mean, and therewith all the hot disdain and stomach of her brother. Hermione, way what our pleasure is. Whilom thou knowest, we entertain thee willingly. Now, seeing thou hast done so far amiss, to reach above thy reach unorderly, in milder words, because we love thee well, lo, we discharge thee of our princely court. Thou mayst no longer with Fidelia dwell, forbidden to her presence to resort. Behold, my ward, that I am no bitter judge, and when thy way, where thou likes to go, it's the only way I take to end the grudge and stop the love that each to other owe. But such haps as might my mind content, whereof the gracious gods have given me store, I count this one, if this I may prevent, the furthest outrage of the swelling sore. Alas, now have I lived too long, I see. Confounded so to yield to fortune's will. My sovereign prince offended thus with me, and I adjudged to death, though living still. Ah, my good lord, whom I have honoured long, long may your highness joy this highest place, thyself the root and cause of mine own wrong. But must I leave to view my lady's face and banished from my prince's royal court, wander as erst the unhappy Oedipus, whose pain my foes will make their chiefest sport, my most unhappy chance will have it thus. No force forsooth, unpitied might he die, that to his sovereign means such villainy. Such villainy? Who ever meant more good? The venom of thy villainy withstood. Armenio, I forbear thee here for reverence. Yet by my prince's leave, in my defence, I may allege I love thy sister here, which love, though I am like to buy full dear, yet is her love more precious than the price. But since long hap prevents our late device, long live my lord, long live my lady's grace. God send them friends as loyal in my place. And trust me, then their fortunes shall be such as not thy love shall ever prove so much. Hermione, give me thy hand. And you. I think this is done to avoid a further ill and double mischief that might else ensue. For my sake, cease to love Fidelia still. Unequal love is enemy to rest. She's too young to love thee as she should. And thou, Hermione, can conceive the rest. My meaning is she loves not as we would. Time may afford to both your heart's desires a new choice to cool these newly kindled fires. Never, alas, never will the, be the day that I shall leave to love Hermione. Sooner shall nature's course quite altered be than I shall leave, dear knight, to honour thee. Good father, let him stay, who, if he part, against law is like to steal away my heart. May it please your grace to keep the body here like enough the heart will hover near. My lord, laugh not oppressed souls to scorn. Losers, they say, may easily be forborn. Forbear these words, and thou, Fidelia, these misbeseeming foolish fashions, stay. Let it suffice that thou shalt live in court. Where, if among the jolly brave resort of sundry knights, noble personage, worthy thy love for gifts and parentage, thou shalt spy one such as we do like. 
our favor shall not be too far to seek. Ah, my, my Hermione. Sweet lady mine, farewell. Farewell the curved, courteous dame that on earth do dwell. Sir, now you are packing, let me know your walk. For I have that may not be passed without some talk nor stands it with mine honour to let thee bear it clear. But I will make thee know Arminio's blood is dear. My lord, I make no challenge with offence, but first I will prepare for my defence. So, sir, you are aforehand, keep you so, and reckoned of Arminio for thy vowed foe. Go. When thy ways obscurer than the night, and fortune for revenge plague thee with spite. And we will just pause there at the exit of Armenio midway through the act. Uh, so, yes, we have Hermione here, some bloke who's in love with the king's daughter, and he gets a bit stabby when, uh, when challenged by the brother. Uh, just a teeny bit stabby. Not too stabby, in the sense it's not fatal. He's just standing, because he does lots of long speeches, presumably bleeding uh, a pace. Um, obviously not, not too bad a wound. Uh, and then a prince comes on and tells, uh, tells him that he's going to, yeah, going to have to banish you, going to have to banish you. Uh, I particularly liked that moment, Hermione, give me thy hand. Adieu. Um, <laughs> the dynamics of how these, this speech, this, the dialogue here can be spoken is really actually quite wide. I'm really interested by the potential that this script is giving us. Uh, thoughts in the room about this? Uh, this uh, we've got love, we've got fortune. Um, I, I don't know if we've got God standing over with, with, with sort of puppet strings or anything during any of this, but um, the options are all there. Uh, first thoughts, general, general ideas, uh, questions, confusions, anything? Uh, Bryony? It's not very general. It's really, really specific. There's mm -hmm. one specific line that really interested me. Um, and I don't know, maybe I'm drawing the wrong thing from it, but I... I I'll, I'll tell you what the line is and what I thought anyway. Um, the she is too young to love thee as she should, and thou, Hermione, canst conceive the rest. Is that alluding to the fact that she is like probably premenstrual even? I don't know. That that was what I took from it. The the, the play on words with the canst conceive the rest, um, and that she's she's too young to give you what you want. I don't know. I liked it. Mm. Mm. Well, that's, uh, yeah, it's good, good, good thought, or at least it could be that's the excuse that's being, you know, depending on, you know, it's just simply she's she's too young by an arbitrary date that I've set because I want this quarrel to be over and you to leave. But yeah, no, I, 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 the question of how old these people are is, of course, quite important um, in terms of uh, how we uh, how we read the text. Um, no, that's re really good thought. Other thoughts, Helen. Yeah, um, carrying on for that, if they're all about 14, then the fact that the two boys are fighting it out is, is, is interesting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and very different from if they're 20-ish um, and capable of doing really serious uh, uh, damage and not so easily separated. Um, I certainly felt that there was the potential for something. Something was going on. Armenio was, there was almost a challenge as soon as we're out of sight of the court. Let's set to it um, at the end there. Mm. Yeah, there's like, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to shadow you to make sure that, you know, you go. Uh, suggestion there that there's yeah more violence is potentially there and the, yeah if they're younger you know the, the, we're at a time when young lads uh, might be out playing at butlers on, on the street is uh, not not an unknown thing but you know, young lads might be might be up to uh, Stephen then Aliki uh, there's, there's a quite a strong parental vibe I think coming off his aunties here rather than I'm the king and I'm deciding this um, is much nicer to people than he needs to be. Um, just going back to that uh, that line that was pointed out, uh, she is too long, 
young to love thee as she should, thou, Hermione, can conceive the rest. My meaning is she loves not as we would. Um, you've, you've got two directions that can go in. You know, we as in we're both men of the world, you know what I mean, nudge, nudge. You know, she is too young. Or we would in the sort of sense of royal we. And, and there's, there's a kind of tension there that you could take in different directions, couldn't you? One is kind of like, I'm the king, what I says goes, I say your name, you go. Uh, and the other is something which is, um, which you could make more of, especially if you, you know, if you have a load of boys about the place, of course. Hmm. Uh, yes. Oh, no, very nice thoughts. Uh, Aliki. Um, yeah, I was really interested in that line, too. And I wondered what exactly too young means in a world in which princesses are sometimes, in, you know, um, engaged pr practically at birth. And certainly you have marriages not consummated, but solemnized between small prepubescent children among royal families. Um, but I, I'm also interested in, in Stephen's point about the language that, that both the king uses and, uh, and Hermione uses. It's very, very affectionate and decent and, and honorable, and it kind of makes you like them. He doesn't feel like a stabby boy. He's like, yes, I have every reason to be grateful to you, and I love her truly, and I don't want to quarrel with you. You've been so good to me. It's all very kind of, you know, decent and straightforward. <laughs> You just are the wrong standing. Uh, I, yeah, there's, it's an interesting question to get that line. My meaning is she loves not as we would. She loves not as we, the royal we, would like her to love. You are not the right person, perhaps. Uh, Eric? I was going to say that uh, I, I like the scene at the beginning where it just kind of, it's a very obvious sort of, foreshadowing of what would ever happen you know if we were separated <laughs> uh, what, what could possibly happen and then obviously they are separated uh, because of this mm, yes okay let's finish the scene gather a little more evidence there isn't that much more to go uh, but anyway armenio uh and we can infer the king as well um possibly i'm not 100 percent certain of that exit hermione is left with penulo who's been described thus far as a parasite but who has really not done anything so hermione and penulo sorry can i just check before we jump back in was it penulo was that the other one that you asked me to read uh, no that's lentulo no, cool okay right farewell my cruel foe not thou nor fortune may add more unto the miseries that I have felt today, nor but by, a, by safe return unto this happy place can gods or fortune make amends in this distressed case. Then cease Hermione to utter speech of this, words not suffice this endless woe, but death ye wis. And part thou from the place a dead and liveless man, robbed of thy senses and thy joy since first this stir began. Oh, good my lord, my good lord Hermione. I am indeed, as thou dost say, Hermione, for that I am Hermione, I am the unhappiest wife that ever hither came. Oh, my good Lord, would God poor Penulo might any way but mitigate this woe, and pleaseth it your honour to, to command my service, or the help of head or hand, Penulo, my worthy Lord, would prove as just as he whom best your honour likes to trust. Say what it is wherein my secrecy may aid your Lordship in this extremity. Penulo, since thou so friendly here dost proffer me the utmost of aid that lies in thee, I do remember that which brought to pass would make me half so happy as I was. Say it, my lord, and constantly I vow it. It shall go hard, but Penulo will do it. Oh, gramercy, gentle friend, then thus it is. 
the lady of my life, Fidelia, is, of whom I am, I know, beloved no less than she of me, my gracious mistress, severed by fortune and our cruel foe, my lord, her brother, Prince Armenio. Now, couldst thou, Penulo, thyself behave on trust to bring my lady to the cave where Willem lovers we were wont to meet in secret sought each other for to greet she wots it well and every corner knows and every uncouth step that thither goes for what is not sharp-sighted lovers see this is the sum of my desire to thee accomplish this and this in silence done my happiness will be again begun. My Lord, I see where unto this talk doth end. I have this lesson at my finger and no more ado, but take you to your flight. We'll make a plaster for the sore ere night. But such a one, as if it be applied, shall do more grief than ease when it is tried. And you low. I yield my life into thy hands. You do, sir, as now the matter stands. Hold, Penulo, and I will look for thee. You will not look for them that come with me. I will be gone and live to see my dear. And exit Hermione. Do so, sir, and perchance be never the near. This is a step that first we used to climb. We that forsooth take hold on every time, men of all hours whose credit such as spites in heat forsooth had called us parasites. And let them spite, we will bite as fast. Penulo, thou spendest words in waste. Fool Hermione, that for hurting thee on slender trust will give a knave his fee. Exit Penulo. Strike up fortune's triumphs with drums and trumpets. Fortune, if she lists, can do. High mistress of the rolling wheel of charts, to overturn, and who can do there too? Or graciously, when please her to advance. No, Lordings. This is fortune's inquiry, and in her pleasure to be changing still, herein consisted fortune's sovereignty, that fortune can on earth do what she will, when men have builded on the surest grounds, their strong devices fortune's power confounds. Enter Venus. Not all in haste, you do not you do not so intend you have begun but i must make an end and exit fortune and venus in true panto uh fairy godmother evil villain style of fortune going aha i have won the day fortune won venus nil but venus coming on uh and uh, and and saying no no it's it's not over yet uh, we're not even into uh, into the second half uh so yeah, uh, Hermione has a plan. She has a cave. Um, he has a cave. Rather. Um, he. I know it's very confusing. This name, Hermione. I'm just. I, I just. Um, I'm just going into pure Harry Potter. It's very confusing my brain. Um, and um, yeah, so there's a plan. There's a servant type figure to enact that plan, but it doesn't look like it's going to go well. Um, thoughts from the room, Maliki. Okay, so uh, just off the top of my head, should we call him Hermione and decide that that's a silent E? That might make it doesn't it doesn't work, unfortunately, with the rhythm. <laughs> I tried, but it just didn't work. Yeah. Okay. Hermione. Is right. Hermione. Oh Hermione? God. I yeah. hate it. I yeah, hate I, it. But yes, yeah. Hermione. Well, I mean, it's quite close to the Greek pronunciation, <laughs> so I'm all right with it. <laughs> Um, so we've had a couple of plays, or I've read several plays in which the gods interfere with human life for some kind of plot. And this one seems really straightforward so far compared to the other ones we've had. Like, you understand what everybody's up to and doing, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how it plays out, but I'm interested in how straight, very straightforward it is. Mm. 
It, it, uh, we were just putting in the chat, Eric and I, uh, uh, just about the use of a cave. And, uh, you know, we have a cave in Dido. We have a cave in uh, Tancred in Gizmunda, which uh, is also later. Um, and and used in sort of similar fashions, uh, you know, potential lovers meeting places. Um, Sophonispa. And in Sophonispa, much further. And interestingly, uh, uh, un unlike Sophonispa or uh, Tancred and Gizmunda, uh, the cave is not literally underneath the bedroom. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the, there's a whole Freudian dimension, uh, which is very strange to be dancing into in the early modern. So, um, yeah, it's uh, there's there's all this stuff at play. Uh, other thoughts before I go too tangentially strange on this. Uh, though tangentially strange is allowed. Uh, Elizabeth. <laughs> Fourth between Barney's characters, Venus, and my character, Fortune. It's like Fortune can't say anything unless Venus confirms it. And I just like that back and forth. It was interesting. Yeah, the, one is not going to allow the other to the final word, are they? There, there's always going to be a stepping in. Uh, other thoughts before we crash into Act 3? And I don't know where we're going in, in Act 3. I've, I've marked a potential stopping point, but we may keep just crashing through it um, and see how far we get. Uh, other thoughts? No, we're eager to find out where we're going. Because it's interesting, Act 1 is all setting up the God side of thing. And now Act 2, we set up what the humans are doing. And yes, it is in relation with what the gods are doing. Um, but yeah, it's like we've had two beginnings. Uh, in these first two acts. So we have yet to sort of hit any kind of complication or extension of that thought. Uh, so uh, we're going into the third act then uh, with Bomelio. Um, in a moment, uh, Lentulo, uh, which uh, is oh, we've just passed on to Bryony, uh, will be entering. Uh, but first we have uh, Bomelio, Solus, like an hermit. He that hath lost his hope and yet desires to live he that is overwhelmed with woe and yet would counsel give. He that delights to sigh, to walk abroad alone, to drive away the weary time with his lamenting moan. He that in his distress despaireth of relief. Let him begin to tell his tale, to rip up all his grief. And if that wretched man can more than I recite, of fickle fortune's froward check and her continual spite, of her inconstant change, of her discourtesy, I will be partner with that man to live in misery. When first my flowering years began to bud their prime, even in the April of mine age and May month of my time, when, like the tender kid, new weaned from the teat, in every pleasant springing mead I took my choice of meat. When simple youth devised to lengthen his delight, even then, not dreaming I on her, she poured out her spite. Even then she took her key and tuned all her strings to sing my woe. List, lordings, now my tragedy begins. Behold me, wretched man that served his prince with pain, that in the honor of his praise esteemed my greatest gain. Behold me, wretched man, that for his public weal refused not with thousand foes in bloody wars to deal. Behold me, wretched man, whose travail, pain, and toil was ever pressed to save my friends from force of foreign spoil. And see my just reward, look on my recompense. Behold by this, for labors past, what guerdon cometh thence? Not by my fiercest foes in doubtful fight with us, but by my fawning friend, I was confounded thus. One word of his despite in question called my name. Two words of his untrusty tongue brought me to open shame. Then was I banished the city, court, and town. Then every hand that held me up began to pull me down. Oh, that the righteous gods should ever grant the power 
that smoothest sands and greenest bogs should soonest me devour. Yet, that I might descry the better their device, here have I lived almost five years, disguised in secret wise. And now, somewhat it is, but what I cannot tell, provokes me forward more than wont to leave my darksome cell, and in my crooked age, instead of mirth and joy, with broken sighs in doleful tunes, to sing of mine annoy. And there is a song you don't have to sing. Thank God. Uh, go, walk the path of plaint. Go wander, wretched, now, in uncouth ways, blind corners fit for such a wretch as thou. There feed upon thy woe, fresh thoughts shall be thy fare, musing shall be thy waiting maid, thy carver shall be care, thy dainty dish shall be of fretting melancholy, and broken sobs with hollow sighs thy savory sauce shall be. But further ere I walk, my servant will I send into the town to buy such things as now he can intend. What, Lentulo? Anon, forsooth. What, Lentulo, come forth. Anon, forsooth. Why, when, I say? Anon, forsooth. Ah, you naughty lout, come out, sir knave, come away. Will you not give one leave to pull down his points? What? Anna should his breeches beret. Enter Lentulo. Go you to the market, and buy such things as needful are for us. Such things as needful are for us? And what are those, I pray? First, there is needful for us a pot of porridge, for I had none this many a day. And then there are needful for us a feather bed, for I lie on a bottle of hay. And then there is most needful for us a pretty proper wench for to laugh and play. Go, buy us some victuals and hie thee home. And Bommilio exits. Now farewell, master mine, good gentle master Mome. Have you seen such a logger-headed fool to say, Go, go, good l Lentulo, to buy my victuals so, and give me money? No. He but for the namesakes, uh, swoons, I were as good serve a master of clouts. He'll do nothing all day long but sit on his arse, as my mother did when she made pouts. And then a looks a this fashion, and thus and thus again, and then, what do ye? By my troth, I stand even thus at him, and laugh at his simplicity. Hath the best manners in the world to bid a man fall to his meat, and then I say, I thank you, forsooth, master, and I could tell what to eat. We too, look you, that's I and he, can lie abed a whole night and a day, and we eat, and we had it, it vattens a man. Look on my cheeks, else, are they not fallen away? Well, I must jog to the town, and I'll tell you what shift I make there. Marry, ye shall promise me not to steal it away. When I come to a rich man's gate, I make a low leg, and then I knock there. And then I begin to cry in at the keyhole, that I may be sure they, hear, they shall hear. God save my good master and my good mistress, a poor boy, a piece of bread and meat for God's sake. And enter Penulo. Uh, Hi. Uh, just checking whose Penulo's dialogue lines. this so is. Is that Penulo yeah. or... Yes, so this should be Penulo entering saying this dialogue. Question mark or is it not? Thoughts on the room before we go forward? No, it is. It is, so it's uh, it's Penulo speaking here. Hey-ho! <laughs> Merrily tricked. Am I not a knave for the nonce that can dispatch two errands at once? I have both told her, even as I should do, and told my young master to meet with him too. Now he, like a gentleman for the valour of his mind, hath sworn by his honour not to stay long behind. 
<laughs> the desire of revenge pricketh him forward so that I am sure he'll not let but to go, and that with all haste possible he may then. Dun, ta -ra, ta -ra. <laughs> we shall have good play. I like such a knave so can tickle them all to set noblemen at a brabble and brawl. Save you, sir, young master, and you be a gentleman. Horse and peasant, seest thou not what I am? Troth, sir, I see you have a good doublet and a pair of hose, but nowadays there is so many goes, so like gentlemen, that such a poor fellow as I know not how a gentleman from a knave to spy. Thou mayest perceive I am no such companion. I am a gentleman, a courtier, and a merry Frank Franian. Then, thou merry companion, thou whoreson Frank Franian, why hast thou abused the law? What, good skipjack, in faith, with thwick-thwack your bones I will claw? Come about, sir knave. Cuts my passion, what a merry maid have we here? Give me your hand, sir, faith. I was bold to brush the dust out of your gear. Pray, sir, tell me, they say in the country tis a common guise that gentlemen nowadays cannot see with both eyes. It's a lie, knave. I know a few gentlemen blind. No, sir. What will you lay, and I can find one with a wet finger that is stark blind? It may be so, but I think thou canst not. Will you lay? Do wager on it. What should I lay? Thou hast no money, I am sure, to pay. But faith, sir, but I'll, no faith, sir, but I'll tell you what our wager shall be, because I am not able to lay any money. I'll lay three round wraps on the ribs with my cudgel here. Soft, let me look first, if there be no blind man near. Content in faith, that bargain shall stand. Then, sir, I must be so bold as to search your purse out of hand. My purse, sir? Wherefore? By my troth, sir, no more but to try, if you be not as blind a gentleman in the purse as I. I use not to carry money in my purse. All in a pocket? Well, never a whit the worse. I must search your pocket. What if it be elsewhere? Wheresoever it is, I must seek out this gear. I'll not lose my wager, that's certain. Very well, sir. Will you put me to pain? Have I never a weapon? A, a look. Pray thee, be content. You shall have your wager, sir, as it was meant. You hold thy hands, good fellow. I'll do anything for thee. I perceive a wise man of a fool overtaken, maybe. Thou blind gentleman, unless it be for my commodity, I'll teach thee to be blind and go so bravely. I'll do anything for thee if thou strike me no more, because I perceive thou art almost as poor as myself am. And yet there is somewhat in thee. I'll prefer thee to a service in the court presently. <laughs> Wilt thou do so? That I will. Wilt thou do so indeed? Swear to me by thy ten commandments in thy creed. I do so. Troth, then, we are friends. Say nothing, I pray, and you shall see me prove a rank runaway. Why, when a man may be a courtier and live at ease, should a not leave his old master to please? Sirrah, blind gentleman, we too blind, ge blind gentlemen, and you do as thou promised here. Perhaps I may be as good to thee as two pots of beer. I'll go with thee, faith. Gore, let's be gone. Soft, tarry a while. I'll go with thee anon. Enter Armenio. Oh, thinkest thou, Penelo? Am I not provided now? I warrant, sir. Sorry to you. Yeah. <laughs> I warrant, sir, I shall have a cold pull of you and a begin to make another brawl. Farewell when thou wilt. I trust I shall meet with him. Am I not almost at the tree? The same is it, sir. Sirrah, what's he? <clears throat> what cares thou I come? Go thou with me. Why, I shall have but an ill-favoured courtier of ye. Now for a runaway, God send us good chance. Then, maids at your marriage, I mean me to dance. And exit Lentulo. Now serves the time to wreak me of my foe. My 
bastard foe that to dishonor me in privy corners seeks to shame me so that my discredit might his credit be and hath my father from his tender youth vouchsafed to bring thee up i did therefore believe so earnestly thy perjured truth advancing still thine honor evermore that not contented with a common rack thou shouldst intend instead the ruin of us all <clears throat> and when thou seemedst afraid to turn thy back to make a glory of our greater fall before thou triumph in thy treachery before thou scapest untouched for thy sin let never fate nor fortune favor me but wretched me let me live and die therein if your words shall serve my deeds shall prove it now that ere i sleep i mean to meet with the owl <laughs> and exit armenio the stage is clear and we're just going to pause there there's an awful lot to unpack in all of that business i should probably have paused <coughs> paused halfway through um but yeah, we've got a lot of comedy business. Um, uh, Stephen suggested in the chat that the Lynchelo would double very nicely with Vulcan, and I have to agree with that double as a, on on principle that they're uh, they're, they're uh, they they work very nicely. Um, but uh, it depends on on how uh, how one wants to do it. There's no absolute state uh, uh, that that has to be. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of moving parts going on here. We've got comedy business. Uh, we've got someone uh off stage um who doesn't want to come on stage for various uh, semi scatological reasons um we've got hitting we've got we've got no stage directions for where the hits live uh we have a labored joke set up of which i'm not wholly sure what the joke is could anyone explain to me what is the what what is this whole what's the the blind man how is that resolved i i didn't follow I mean, beyond the fact I'll just hit you until you lose consciousness uh, kind of thing until you agree with me. Um, I know physical violence is always hilariously funny. Um, but, yeah, is, is there more to it than that? Thoughts in the room? Because I'm, I'm genuinely lost. Brani? I'm not sure, but it all, I don't know. It almost seemed like... I would say I don't mean to get the blind bit, though. It was, it, yeah, it was almost like if you've got less money in your pocket than me, then... Um, you're, you're obviously not a gentleman, um, but yeah, it was it was very tenuous. Yeah, uh, uh, Aliki. I read it that way too. Something to do with the emptiness of the purse or lack of money. Is there a blind kind of like being empty? I I don't know. Hmm. What pun is being in, employed here at great length, uh, Lois? Yeah, I'm not sure. I was trying to figure out. I mean, clearly. Um, Lenchlow's partly, I think, trying to rob uh, Penula, but uh, is he saying that pe uh, pe gentlemen in the country are so blind they can't seem to ever to find any money or they can't can't see the money, in, in which case, you know, there's no money in my purse, <laughs> uh, the, the, there's no money in my pocket, there's no money in my codpiece or wherever else you're looking. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, because the, the, it's a sort of um, it's a wager, isn't it? I mean, I'll, you know, because he asks, is there any blind man around here? Because if there is, that would ruin the bet. Uh, but but the then the idea is to prove that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, as far as I can see, the bet is, is, is there some blind person in the country? And he's somehow getting him to uh, to agree that he's that he is blind and um, uh, it's obviously got to do with being robbed in some trick. I'm trying. It's it's a bit like some of the Robin Hood ballads where you get people. You, you know, there's one where I think the, the the bishop says he has no money, and of course Robin Hood finds money, and after having prayed to the Virgin to send it, and then says, "Oh, look, Our Lady has sent me all this money." I mean, it seems to me there's some such joke going on here. Yeah, the, the, there's some sort of punning or, or play, and and then it ends with physical violence. Um, uh, Eric, uh, I think I saw Alan as well, so Eric and Alan. I was going to say that it seems like sort of, you know, I was both to brush the dust out of your gear. It's, it just seems sort of like, yes, patting him down, like, oh, hello there. And so, like, you know, maybe patting his pockets for money <laughs> and other things for money. And then sort of, I don't know, that's kind of what I pictured, but I don't, and sort of how, you know, they can be deceived quite easily, I guess. I don't know. 
it's also you know one with a wet finger uh, as well uh you know which is it's, 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 it's <laughs> Yeah. What, what, again, I, I feel like we're just simply missing some co- common context at the time that this all makes perfect sense, but we, we, we just can't unpack it and that we need to find a way of doing that. Um, uh, but yes, it's, it's, it's this sort of weird comic bit. And we've, we've had in other plays, later plays where, um, you know, you have the semi-villainous character who's doing something and then they encounter a comedy character and they then have a terrible time. <laughs> um, uh, I'm forgetting plays off the top of my head that do this, but uh, there, there are other examples of this where it's like the, 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 the wicked person ends up with a comedy double act, uh, comedy servant following them. It's not quite Blackadder and, and uh, uh, Baldrick, but it's uh, it's in that sort of area. A leaky. Oh, no, sorry. Alan, then leaky. Sorry. I'm, I must admit, I saw that sequence as being much more akin to the Broker's Men in whichever pantomime you happen to pick out, where the words are not really important. <coughs> the whole thing is basically an excuse for a, a comedy fight. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, but it's not that the words aren't important. They are setting up, you know, <coughs> it's a setup to do with a pun, a misunderstanding of what he means by the phrase and then there is a trick solution to it that Lentulo uses as an excuse to to beat the living daylights out of him um that seems to be the structure but i don't know what the joke is explicitly yeah. i know what the situation is i don't know what the joke is if that makes sense uh aliki so I'm coming round to two things, and I, I don't really know how they fit. One is the only thing I can think of for a wet finger that isn't obscene is telling which way the wind blows, right? So you lick your finger and you hold it up, and whichever side feels cold, that's the direction the wind is coming from. I, I like that. That works. That works. My father taught me as a sailing trick when I was a kid. Mm. So... Um, Maybe that's got something to do with it. And something to do with blind, as in blind alley, blind. Yeah? Mm. Not sure. But uh, where was I going with this? Yeah, something happens in it, in the course of which, um, and I don't know if he's paying him off or if he's genuinely charmed by how tricksy he is and finds it useful. But uh, Penulo decides at some point to get him a position, right? Or offers him a job. Says, I will be offering you a job lately. So there's something else that's <clears throat> happened in that. But I agree about the comedy business. It's obviously an excuse to have a hilarious comedy fight, which I only realized like three quarters of the way through the scene as we were reading and thought, I read that all wrong. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing of the absence of stage directions. Uh, <laughs> Helen, then, and Lois. Uh, we've then got a problem of um, Arminio and Lentulo, who interact. Yeah, I did wonder whether that was just a, uh, a, a misattribution of first, uh, but it seems to be Lentulo. It seems to be written like him, so it's very confusing if it isn't. Yeah, I mean, uh, Arminio comes out, speaks to Penulio, and, and Lentulo intervenes with something. Uh, and Arminio says, farewell when thou wilt. Uh, I was wondering whether that's Lentulo effectively threatens, ah, somebody else for me to hit, holds up his club and he just goes, okay, I'll be back in a minute. Um, and it's actually a bit of additional or, business. Or farewell when thou wilt is, is, is a way of saying, I can do without you. Mm. Um, but I trust I shall meet with him. He's talking about... Who is he talking to and about? He's because talking. He... I, he's talking to Penulo about. Am I at the right place to get at um, uh, Hermione? So him is her, 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 my, uh, Hermione. Yes. However, we decide to pronounce it. Yes. Yes. So that's right. the thing. Is he? The, the, Penulo is the agent for Arminio to get at the uh, the uh, at these uh, the, the this lover. Um, and yeah, it may be if they're in the, still in the middle of some business and he just comes in and goes, I won't keep you. Um, but is, the, is this the right way to the tree? Uh, and he just doesn't want to get involved. I don't know if that's yeah. too silly. Um... 
Yeah, and and then they go out, and Armenio is left to soliloquise. Yeah, uh, Lois then Stephen. Yeah, again, I'm just wondering that there's some kind of sort of magic trick. I mean that. Uh, Somehow, um, the point about being blind is you didn't see, you know, whatever clever thing I have just done, um, such as getting your money away from you. You know, here it is. Uh, I mean, that would perhaps explain why uh, Penulo thinks this is the perfect guy to bring to court, which is full of crooks anyway and thieves, and you know, uh, might be something like that anyway. I like that. Yeah, uh, I think this is one we need to workshop, um, <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I try to make sense of this, so I'll offer my tuppence. Um, start, that, that whole sort of gentleman blind thing, it starts with, are you a gentleman or aren't you? And then Lentulus comes up with the proverb, they say, gentlemen cannot see with both eyes. And at that point, it just sort of screeches around the corner on two tyres, and it goes in a completely different direction, which is... Wait, uh, wait, uh, gentleman blind, he, he completely misses the point and goes, well, wait a minute, there aren't any blind gentlemen. And then it gets into the bed. So so that sort of, it's it's almost, um, you know, that, that could be almost anything. We go from, are you a gentleman? Uh, and the sort of status stuff that's going on there to the, um, the, the fighting, the wagering, the arguing. And the fact that the, the sort of, the blindness bit in, in the middle, it, it could be almost anything. And it's just something that links gentlemen. This is proverb or made up proverb. And then that gives them the excuse to sort of brabble and brawl. Uh, Bryony. I'm just wondering whether or not it could even be um, a bit of a dig at Armenio himself. Um, because it's just before he comes on um, and he is sort of this this gentleman and there is the whole adage of, of love is blind and, and all that sort of thing. And I'm wondering if perhaps it is also a bit of a mockery of him before he comes in. Uh, yes, I was making affirmative noises, but was uh, muted. Um, yes, uh, I, 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 I think before we get too sidetracked down this this element of business, we should go back to the beginning of the act as well uh, and actually talk about Bomilio, um, uh, who uh, enters with this great long speech. It's uh, very nicely written. Uh, I, I, I put it in the chat that it did remind me a bit of, uh, further down the line, uh, s some of the devices that Lily will employ. Uh, it's written in a very different style in many ways, but um, you know this this figure who comes on makes this long speech about how sad they are, um, and and dances dances back and forth. And I'm just wondering if Lily is sitting here watching this play, going, "Oh yeah, this this is the," or is this the kind of shtick that is expected at court and uh, and therefore informs later uh, later plays doing the same kind of thing? Um, yeah, thoughts about Bomilio. Um, he, uh, the song, um, his sad life, and the fact that he's obviously, you know, that he employs Lentulo, I mean, for some reason. Goodness only knows. You can't get the staff these days, can you? Uh, any thoughts in the room about uh, this character who we haven't really fully engaged with? He hasn't engaged with really about many other people. Lois? I don't know. These hermits are all over the place in <coughs> romance and uh, drama. Uh, it's also really funny, this this guy you think, you know, hermit living in a cave alone. Oh, he has a servant. Of course, everybody has to have a servant. I mean, you can't expect him to cook for himself. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, he just, uh, the, the hermits in Mallory, for example, usually are uh, retired knights. They've had some sort of heroic past. And this one appears to have had a heroic past as well, but to have been betrayed by somebody. I mean, that's about all we know about him. He, he should be fairly misanthropic and bitter with that background. Yes, but who? It doesn't. It doesn't really make clear who betrayed him, or is it just the the yeah. the, the a prince or some His friend? Yeah. Some some someone. Uh, yeah. Maybe that will become clear later on. Uh, Eric. I was going to say. <laughs> really badly uh that maybe he's like the older person in a pandemic who has to like use someone else to get supplies um but maybe that's just me and current <laughs> events yeah i think let, let, let's let's not start triggering anyone uh aliki so without uh, wishing to bring the duck call on my head i'm going to guess that this is an, an elderly gentleman 
whose uh, noble child thinks he is not a gentleman uh, yep. and is going to find out later. But we know he, the father is a gentleman because he has a servant. And that's why he has a servant, <laughs> so that we know that he's upper class. Yeah, that's the kind of things that will turn up in uh, old wives' tale a little li further down the line, and things like that. You know, there's this this random misanthropic person in the wilderness who turns out to be somebody else. Uh, it's 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 yeah, it's 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 a bit of a trope in in other literature all over the place. So yeah, absolutely, uh, Eric. Didn't we have a similar thing where uh, I mean, based on like his description, where um, in Fair M, where the Miller is like actually a former knight and sort of has lost all his property and stuff oh, yeah. <laughs> and only has the mill, <laughs> but also has a servant uh, who is a clown. Yes, absolutely. I totally forgotten that in, about Fair M. Um, yes, uh, which again is a little further in the future, I think, off the top of my head. But, uh, you know, a lot of these plays are all very, very stones throw away from each other. And also they, you know, this play gets printed, uh, you know, about seven years after it's written. So it has a wider hinterland uh, in, uh, in, in terms of the popular imagination. Helen. Um. One of the things that we know about um, the guy whose name I, I am, re the guy who I am reading, but whose name I cannot pronounce, um, is that he must, however foundling he is, be of noble birth because he has noble impulses. And for some reason in the early modern period, it was felt that you only, uh, princesses only fell in love with you, however poor your exterior, if in fact you were a prince in disguise. It's the rule of narrativium. Yeah, um, con con continues, continues to a degree to this day. Um, and uh, yes, and, and can be uh, uh, seen in other texts. OK, we're into extra time, so uh, it's time to go around the room for final thoughts. We're not quite halfway through the play, but we're close to it. We're midway through an act, so there's a lot more. You know, we've got the anticipation of what's going to happen when Arminio bumps into the lovers as they meet. Uh, will they all coincide at the same time, or will they come into in different combinations? Who knows? Um, but yes, as ever, we're, the general lens is the question of how we might produce this today. Uh, we have all the mediums available. Uh, in our imaginations, uh, uh, what what are we liking? Um, any issues that we want to flag up that we might want to adjust? Um, or just just general thoughts. Uh, obviously, uh, say if you want to reserve judgment and just say I'll wait until tomorrow, that's absolutely fine. If you have nothing to say, just flat wave wavers on. It's allowed. Uh, Stephen, do you have any final thoughts? Um, oh, you've just muted yourself. That's clever. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm not really in any doubt who's going to win out over love and fortune at this point, which suits me fine. Because um, <laughs> that's all I say, really. I, I think, you know, that it, it there was all sorts of interesting stuff going on at the beginning, wasn't there? You know, with the gods and the, the furry rising out of the floor and, and, and all the rest of it. But... Um, you know, it might almost be one of these kind of, um, you know, they've, they've just kind of got together after the, after all five of them have written one act each, you know, and going, where's the through line? But I don't care because I'm enjoying it. Well, you say you've no doubt how it's going to, who's going to win. Uh, what, what do you think the final score will be? Uh, it's it's one nil currently to Fortune. Um... Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, racking my brains for a love tennis pun there. Um, no, I, I don't know about the score, but um, the vibe of it is is definitely a comedy vibe, isn't it? I mean, even, you know, I think that the, the way the king sort of did the banishment, I think, was, was a kind of turning point. But then we've just got all this great physical stuff. Um, and I'm really interested in the in the in the way the, the play offers us, you know, sort of stately pictures, as it were, and shows and something which we can't quite work out, but which seems to be, I think somebody said in the chat, you know, knock about physical comedy and how those two things coexist in, in a sort of theatrical space. 
I think that that's really interesting. I, I'm really interested to see if it if that you know those two things come back together again. Yeah, this this play is uh, throwing us all of the theatrical tricks. Uh, you know, we got song, we got if not necessarily dance, we've definitely got movement. Uh, we've got potentially special effects to go with uh, furies. We've got comedy. We've it's, it's giving us everything. Uh, Elizabeth, final thoughts. <laughs> This play, I feel like it's one of those plays that you can just sort of sink into and you just let the action just unfold and let the dialogue and the narrative kind of wash over you. It does remind me of the mini plays, which I love. Um, I like how it's heating up. I like how the action's heating up and I like the characters. I love the dumb shows. I thought that in my imagination, I thought these would be really powerful dumb shows on stage, really powerful, really um, theatrical, really elaborate. I really like the characters. And I like what I like is that there's a bit of repartee between characters and they bounce off each other really quickly, really snappily. I love the use of rhythm and meter in the in the long speeches. Because we've done a lot of plays with long speeches, but this is one of those where the long speeches don't feel long at all. They kind of roll off the tongue. They're really like, they're really sumptuous. And I, I like them a lot. So I'm really enjoying this play so far. I'm a bit sad that I won't be able to be here tomorrow and finish it. But um, I think it's been an enjoyable read. Uh, but you will be back for Act 5 because we're doing a, uh, a little bit of the uh, the text on Wednesday. So you will find out how it ends. You will get a yes. score at least. Um, uh, Helen, final thoughts? Yeah, the thing that intrigued me about this is the way the rhythm and the style of the writing changes between characters. I mean, we're used to stuff changing a bit between acts but this isn't even between scenes. It's almost as if uh, you've got half a dozen, you know, a writer's room with different writers taking on different characters. I mean, Venus is, is being written by someone who's into 14ers. Um, <laughs> Jupiter only gets the pentameter person. Mm. Um, I mean, it, it Okay, I don't know these plays nearly as well as I would like to, but I haven't come across this sort of wild changing um, switcheroo type thing before. Though, it, well, it, we we may have done, but sometimes the the the, the texts have been so untidy; it's very difficult to tell. Um, uh, so, so the, the, there may be some ambiguity on that. But yes, you're right. In terms of deliberate playing around with uh, the structure, we haven't had this very often. Um, Lois, final thoughts. Uh, well, in some ways, it's very formulaic, but uh, it's, it seems to be the, the ultimate crowd pleaser. I mean, it's throwing in absolutely everything that uh, people could want. Plenty of action, dumb shows, music, uh, fights, uh, uh, surprising taste for long speeches as well. But I would guess the crowd possibly liked those too. Uh, and, uh, 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 you know, and the framing device, which, which allows you to do pretty much anything you want because just have some God or personification decide to push the action in a particular direction. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, I'll wait and see how it goes. Hmm. Yeah, I've done. It, it, it's. I mean, it does mix it up. I mean, there aren't that many what you'd call really long speeches. There's some people get uh, speeches, as it were, but uh, it's it's not overstaying its welcome. It's not like here is a long speech and here is another long speech and here is another long speech. A leaky final thoughts. Uh, I'm I'm really enjoying it. I'm enjoying the formulaic aspect. I'm particularly enjoying the elegance of the language. Uh, I said it in the chat about. Uh, Bo Bomilio, Bomilio's speech, mm -hmm. that he says it all so beautifully in these elegant rhyming couplets that I'm much busier admiring the beauty of what he's saying than feeling sorry for him. That's <laughs> what he's asking me to do. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm looking forward to, to seeing seeing the plots play out. Yeah, as, as as we were saying in the chat, uh, that that's probably why he, he the long speech is followed by a song because you know the music will get 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 you get you there emotionally even if the speech doesn't. <laughs> uh, Alan, final thoughts. I must admit, I'm I'm struggling to work out what the 
plots are where they're supposed to be going. Um, at the moment, it does seem to be an awful lot of excuses for set pieces, either the costumes, dumb shows, or the scenes that we've highlighted, which look as if they could actually be a setup for a, a pre-existing comedy scene, fight, or whatever. Um, so I'm confused at the moment. In terms of the, the you know, the overall <coughs> plot is, you know, uh, I mean, in a sense, we've got an outer plot and we've got an inner plot. I mean, there's a sort of a play within a play element to this, uh, which we've seen in other texts as well. So um, <laughs> it is a question, I think, on practical staging terms of how long that first act should last. Um, you know, much as I like it, if the core of the story is to actually get into, are we supposed to be getting into that central love story? story or with the human people uh and the framing devices to set that up or is it actually the central story less important than the framing story and actually we're more interested in what the gods are doing and are the gods doing additional things so when we stage it are we having lots of gods wandering around constantly doing sprinkling fairy dust all over the place so i think there's an interesting question about where the focus of of the production would need to be um because say it's a very much Act one and act two are totally different beasts. Um, whereas act two and act three are very similar. Uh, Alan? I, I think actually following on that framing device thing, the way I would see it in some ways would be that effectively after the end of act one, the gods, less any who are required for doubling, as we've mentioned with Vulcan, um, are sitting as an audience in a gallery or a side space um, watching the effects of the chaos that they've uh, engendered. Hmm. Yeah. It. It. Yeah. I, I, that. That. That's. That's a nice option. Uh, I, I. We. We. We've talked about actually when gods have interfered with things. You know, with, especially with Dido, but with with others as well, where that that question of what the gods are doing um, as the action unfolds. So that's a that's a nice follow on. Eric, final thoughts. Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying uh, enjoying the the comedy shenanigans and stuff, and of course, you know the the gods um, battling each other. What what I realized about two minutes ago while we were talking, while everyone else was talking, was that um, "Give me your hand, sir" seems to be like a sort of signifier for like comedy business. Sort of "Give me your hand, sir." Adieu, and you know, like or "Give me your hand, sir." Uh, I'll uh, I was wrong to dust off your gear and that kind of thing. Which is a bit of a weird, um, <laughs> I don't know, observation, I guess. Uh, Lois. Yeah, there's just one thing about shaking hands, which is that people did it on parting rather than on meeting in this period. I mean, someone will say things like, "I might be persuaded to shake hands with my virtue," which means, in fact, you know, give up being virtuous. <laughs> oh, I like that. Yes. Um... Uh, uh, and then, uh, Bryony, uh, final thoughts from you? Uh... Um, I, I don't have anything massively insightful about the play, but thank you for welcoming me. It's been a really interesting session. Um, I was completely novice to all this. I, I, I know a fair bit about the, the duck man, but yeah, this every, everything else is all new to me. So it's been really interesting and, and there's been some really valuable ideas exchange going on. So thank you. Yeah. Yes, it's it's one of those things that diving in uh, uh, at this where we're, we're, we're discussing, it. oh, it's like this play, it's like that play, it's, it, which are all available on YouTube. You can watch now. If you have approximately a year to watch, uh, they are all available um, now. We've done pretty much every play uh, now prior to, written prior to 1590-ish. Um, we are now getting to the, the last dregs of, uh, we'll be moving forward. Uh, after Easter, we should start in a much more forward direction uh, as we head to the end of the 16th century. Um, uh, so, yes, it can be a bit uh, a bit intimidating for, for new viewers as well of just going, we're talking about this play, we're talking about that play. Hopefully the, you can follow links and you'll be able to uh, find uh, other plays that are, are of interest and connection with this play. There's quite a few of these pastoral dramas that have a lot of gods wandering around. It's been a long time since this room did the arraignment of Paris, which featured a tree. Uh, and um, and lots of gods and Venus and and uh, uh, various questions uh, of gods being in competition with each other. Um, I mentioned uh, Play of the Weather, which is a very different earlier play uh, where Jupiter uh, basically there's a lot of 
gods arguing about who should, uh, uh, how the weather functions and uh, Jupiter puts it out for tender as to what should happen. Uh, we've recently done the Cobbler's Prophecy, which featured a lot of gods. Um, also some other big problems, but the first session on that was really fun. Um, then it went weird and bad. We walk away and ignore that. Um, but opened in a similar sort of fashion to this play, so that's really interesting. And it, a lot of plays by John Lilly that we've been doing recently, where Lilly comes a few years after this and is perhaps, especially as this is, we know this was definitely performed for the Queen, that there might be uh, a sort of ongoing tradition of a certain kind of drama that is uh, that the Queen's into and that there is definitely an audience for. So uh, this is all part of a, a network of plays that are connected in tangential ways, as well as wider literature. So, um, yes, it can be a bit, uh, a bit like diving into an awful lot of stuff, but um, once, once you've got, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, a dip to toe in, you will, you will find you can plunge deeper into other things. Any final thoughts that uh, anyone wants to leap in after that long ramble from me? Like anyone needs to hear my voice anymore. All that remains, thank all the wonderful readers today. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye. Yeah.